So what we have here is a parietal cell. And unfortunately, although the title of the image makes that clear, it's not actually labeled. So I'm gonna do that first. Okay, so I guess I'll just put it here. So this is a parietal cell. You find these in the gastric mucosa, along with enteroendocrine cells and zymogenic or chief cells. Um, and all of those cells have different jobs that are involved with the events in the stomach but these ones are acid specialists. So if we want to activate pepsinogen and turn it into pepsin, the pH in the stomach has to be below a certain amount, which requires that we do something to make acidity. So I think it's helpful to just remind ourselves what the definition of an acid is, um, just because checking back in with basics helps to reinforce them. So an acid is any compound that donates protons, also called hydrogen cations, to a solution. So notice that the word solution is part of the definition of acid, which implies we're talking about protons floating around in water. So one thing that's not pictured here is the contribution of histamine that's coming from both the submucosa and mucosal cells um, that basically makes your capillaries in your stomach wall permeable and allows water to leak out of your blood. And then that water gets combined with protons here for a nice low pH gastric juice. So the goal is to create some kind of acid. And then once that acid dissociates in solution, which is what acids do, take the resulting proton and make sure that it ends up in the gastric lumen so that it can run into food and help to break it down. And also convert our first uh, peptidase into the active form. So two things required. We need to denature proteins and we need to activate pepsinogen. So acidity does both of that. So let's start up here and note that they've just said metabolism without bothering to explain anything about what that means. Um, so if you're wondering, it's actually just the metabolism. Oh no, what happened? Come back. There we go. It's actually just the metabolism that you're used to thinking about on terms of cellular metabolism. So the series of events that oxidize fuel to make ATP. Um, and so we're gonna just write that. So that's the formula for glucose. And we have six molecular oxygen. And the ultimate yield is six CO2. Plus six H2O or water. So obviously in this arrow, this includes all of those events, which we're not gonna go back into here. It's just, it's a good reminder that for summary reactions like this one, there's a lot more steps that are, than are implied by the overall reaction. So this should be familiar to you, however, as should the reaction that's pictured inside of the parietal cell, because 
you first learned about the combustion of glucose to generate the energy to make ATP in either biology 160 or even sooner than that in high school biology. And then we've talked about this carbonic anhydrase reaction a lot. So one cool thing that your cells can do is make water from scratch. We call this metabolic water. So it's not water that you drank, it's water that you made. And then of course, this is our familiar CO2, which is a byproduct of cellular respiration. Um, we use that as a buffer and we also breathe it out. So that's where that's coming from. Okay. So having established that, any cell that's metabolically active and which contains mitochondria is going to be doing this. And so just by virtue of it existing, it's going to be producing both carbon dioxide and water. So if that's going to happen anyway, just by necessity, you might as well use that to make useful stuff. So in the case of parietal cells, this is the reaction that's going to use the byproduct of cellular metabolism and recycle them into carbonic acid. So one thing, one other thing that's missing from this particular picture here is that the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is carbonic anhydrase, which you should be familiar with also from inside of red blood cells. And guess what? when we get to the urinary system, we're gonna see the same reaction again because it's critical for how the kidneys help balance our pH, again, by manipulating bicarbonate and protons. So carbonic anhydrase is a big deal. It's important for a lot of processes in our body, not just one. And here's another place where that's true. So carbonic anhydrase is gonna catalyze this reaction and then leave unchanged so it can go off and do it again. And then we have carbonic acid. And this exists very briefly because of course it's an acid. So when it hits the water that is making up the majority of the cytosol, it's gonna donate its proton. And that yields a proton, which is a unit of acidity. So pH stands for potential hydrogen, meaning how much hydrogen is that acid going to donate in total. And then the conjugate base for carbonic acid is of course bicarbonate. And we know that that's important for buffering things for a variety of reasons. And it's also not especially useful for buffering if it's trapped inside of a cell. So what we do is we transport it out so that it can be used in the blood plasma as part of our blood buffer system that helps us avoid alkalosis or acidosis and keep our blood pH right around 7.4 as much as possible. So we initially talked about this in the respiratory system, um, but now we're seeing the same set of events again. And oh, look, once again, we're going to exchange that bicarbonate for chloride because their net negative charge is the same. And cells like to be more electronegative on the inside than they do on the outside. So if we're going to be kicking something that's an anion out, we need to gather something else in. And in this case, this is exactly the same thing that's happening in red blood cells that we call the, excuse me, chloride or hamburger shift, chloride referring to the chloride ion and hamburger ref referring to the fellow that discovered it, whose last name was Hamburger. So if we know that we need hydrochloric acid, which the formula for that is HCl, we've got one ingredient for that here, just popping off of carbonic acid. But again, similar to chloride, this is not used, or excuse me, similar, similar to bicarbonate, this is not useful when it's inside of the cell, we have to put it in the lumen. So we need to exchange it for something else. So again, we're balancing our charges by exchanging one cation for another. But in this case, this transport is active and it requires ATP. So you actually have to spend an ATP to do this. So part of the initial cost 
of creating digestive juices to digest food that you're going to use to make ATP is you have to little you have to spend a little bit of ATP to even get that process rolling. So that's part of what we call your energy budget based on your metabolism. How much ATP are you spending in order to extract energy to make ATP out of the food we eat? So we just go ahead and spend an ATP and exchange our hydrogen for potassium because potassium is a super abundant cation, assuming that you have normal eating and drinking habits. So it's not like it's especially scarce and lots of foods contain potassium. So not hard to come by. So we're gonna go ahead and put our proton out here in the water that is in the stomach lumen. But remember, the job of parietal cells is to produce hydrochloric acid, not just protons. So that requires chloride. Fortunately, that's pretty easy. If we're exchanging bicarbonate for chloride, that means that we're constantly putting chloride into our parietal cell, which is gonna create a scenario where the concentration of chloride inside of the cell is consistently high compared with the concentration of chloride in the lumen of the stomach. So all that's really required for chloride to make it into the lumen is a channel that it can passively flow through. So no ATP required, it's just going through a chloride channel. And there we have our other ingredient for HCl. So it's important to remember that any acid, based on the definition I wrote up and to the left, um, is going to exist in equilibrium with the products that it makes when it dissociates. So just like the carbonic anhydrase reaction is reversible, so is the acid dissociation. So there's going to be in the stomach some amount of hydrochloric acid in its undissociated form and that's gonna exist at equilibrium with protons and chloride ions. So that's how parietal cells make hydrochloric acid. What they're doing is basically just saying, okay, we're already doing metabolism for other reasons, housekeeping, cell, cell maintenance reasons. We might as well use the products of that and repurpose them for something else. So in that case, we are taking the proton and putting it in the lumen and then the bicarbonate we can exchange easily for chloride and that takes care of our chloride requirements. Et voila, we've got hydrochloric acid. So because the exchange with the proton requires that we trade one cation for another in an effort to do some balancing, that's gonna create a scenario where there's a constant influx of potassium into the parietal cell as long as it's busy metabolizing. So what we don't wanna do is allow potassium specifically to accumulate inside the cell, because again, that's gonna throw our electronegativity balance that the cell prefers off. And we're already losing negative charge in the form of chloride. So if there's a loss of negative charge and an influx of positive charge, that has to be balanced in some way as well. So one of those ways is that if it's consistently high in here, if we put a channel on this side of the membrane, it can just trickle out. And then because potassium and sodium are the major players for electronegativity for a lot of cells, whether or not they're electrically excitable. So in this case, it's not a cell that depolarizes, but nevertheless, sodium, potassium are still major, play, major players. So in order to keep the potassium exiting, we have to keep the internal potassium high enough that the concentration gradient drives potassium this way. So this sodium potassium ATPase 
is going to take care of that and also work to consistently balance the charges that are entering and leaving. And of course, the sodium and potassium do have other roles in other metabolic processes inside of this cell, but those ones are not relevant to the scope of our course, so I won't discuss them here. But suffice it to say, even though there is a lot of ionic movement in chemistry happening, the upshot is that it's all chemistry that we've talked about before. It's just in a new setting. So I mentioned talking about proton pump inhibitors. So if you have hypersecretion of hydrochloric acid in the stomach, that can create problems. So we've talked about gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD, and that can end up damaging the lower esophageal sphincter, and that can end up damaging the lower esophageal mucosa. And if that persists for long enough, you can get metaplasia of the esophageal stratified squamous epithelium into a columnar epithelium and metaplasia, which is the transition of one cell type to another cell type, is usually a warning sign of cancer. So we want to avoid that. So it's important for us to be able to keep this hydrochloric acid confined to the stomach and away from our esophagus. Unfortunately, sometimes our phys physiology just doesn't cooperate with that um, for a variety of reasons. Some of it genetic, some of it based on diet and other things. But regardless, if we have hypersecretion of acid and it's creating painful symptoms and side effects, the obvious medical solution to that is going to be, well, let's pump the brakes on hydrochloric acid secretion, right? So the drugs that do that are mostly targeting this pump, which is why we call them proton pump inhibitors. So the reason I mention these is because they're a common drug. A lot of you may be familiar with them, but in a clinical setting, um, if you read the warnings on proton pump inhibitors, like omeprazole, which is probably the most common one. Um, so let, let's say I E omeprazole. You can get this over the counter in bulk at, tar at uh, Costco for not very much. You can also be prescribed it, doesn't matter. Um, it does the same thing. It's gonna say, hey, why don't we not do this as much? Here's the thing though. Omeprazole is just a molecule that happens to effectively block this pump. It doesn't know that it's only supposed to block this pump in the stomach. And when you consume omeprazole, it ends up in the bloodstream, so it can go anywhere and therefore can affect proton pumps in other locations in the body. So if you look at the warnings on omeprazole and some other proton pump inhibitors, what you'll see is this uh, recommendation that you not take the drug consistently every single day for longer than a couple months at most. So it recommends taking it to manage symptoms, but trying to take breaks as well and use other strategies to manage acid. And that is because if you just kind of bombard your system with omeprazole and you end up with a high concentration of it in your blood and fluids, it will also start affecting the proton pumps in your kidneys that help you pee out acid. So this long-term use can result in kidney damage, and also acidosis. Because if your kidneys can't help you pee out the protons, the protons stay in your fluids and begin to accumulate. So while omeprazole and other proton pump inhibitors are very effective ways to treat acid reflux and related stomach problems, there is an associated cost. So you have to be careful about the duration that you take them, essentially.
like with most things, there's a specific reason why the stuff has evolved to be the way it is. And if you mess with it, there's consequences. So that's kind of the moral of that story. Okay, so that's really all you need to know about hydrochloric acid secretion. And so I will conclude my recording here.